ship, put it in your ship, and take that ship to market. So which will allow us to sell whatever you find. Now it's gonna either come from salvage, ship. You can also go to market, pick up a, whatever you wanna buy, whatever they're selling. Uh, that'll automatically be put in your ship and then you can take and sell that as well. So that we're hoping to get all sorts of trade routes. Buy to a port and they will just buy from a computer 200, 300 units of steel or whatever. And that will automatically be generated on your ship. So they have a really quick time of just buying what they want, getting back into space and trading. Whereas salvage players, pirates, they can physically walk up to a box, pick it up, manually take it over to their ship, or take it to market and sell it. So they have a much more lengthy gameplay, but it should be fun for them to be able to see what they're taking and individually picking what they want. We've obviously already got cargo boxes built. We've got ships with uh, interiors already set up so we can start placing. Here's where cargo will fit. Here's where we can store it. So those will probably come along side by side and then we should be good to go. Then we should be able to, to see very quickly and um, steal their cargo. So then we're going to have, hopefully, players wanting to protect their cargo. They start hiring mercenaries to come and protect them and then bounty hunters to hunt down the pirates that stole off them in the first place. So hopefully from having that initial cargo route from one to another, we should so, yeah, incorporate all the cargo systems, the new weapon systems to a level that we have uh, for the ships uh, as well. And it was, uh, it was a really interesting, uh, really interesting experience to work on. But one of the main mechanics that I had to introduce was uh, I had to find amp, which it was shown in like in the cinematic. Problem being that the constellation mechanics uh, system that the, the, the wheels basically fold onto the body of the vehicle and then deploy when it needs to go outside or when it does its off-road duties. That as well as a uh, deployable turret that deploys via a rail system to get the, the, the rover be able to clear the ramp of the constellation. And sort of cleaned it up as best they could and then we sort of model on top of that. And then from there we just refine the mesh and uh, start adding geometry to, to get a better idea of how it all works. And then on this particular one, because the space was so tight, I also animated it as I was going along so I could, there were certain shapes I, you know, I had to change so that it could fold up and, and work. So the um, both consoles for both people sort of fold away, allowing more sort of leg room to get in and get out. When the pilot will get in, uh, the cockpit, uh, the console will slide away uh, and then sort of like rebuild itself uh, around the pilot to sort of, you know, get in and drive. Seats, weapon lockers, it's got a couple of, uh, couple of access points so the four sort of uh, standing crew can come in and out as they want, kind of sort of come alive a bit more. Because you can sort of, you can get to the planet surface and you can, you can explore more than you could if you were on foot. So say you wanted to get from, you know, one place to another without the rover and sort of fly up into sort of atmosphere and then come back down again, which you might miss something interesting like a ravine or something, a crater with have some sort of interesting building or something in it. Whereas with the rover, you can sort of drive around and get much more sort of in-depth information on the terrain and stuff and possibly find something more interesting than if you were just flying around the atmosphere or uh, orbiting kind of thing. So you can, you know, you can get your friends, you can go down to the planet's surface and you can sort of rove around. You can even do sort of drive-by shootings if you want to and have the back door open and, you know, two guys like crouch down with machine guns while you're sort of driving around, which is, which is pretty cool. Planet side, which we've just shown in the demos, uh, Chris really was pushing for a personal, personal vehicle basically, essentially a space motorcycle, like a space hog. Um, and so with that in mind, the, you know, the Drake Dragonfly is kind of like the perfect candidate, you know, because it's, it's styling is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit lowbrow, you know, it's quite mechanical, especially, you know, we've just been dealing with the Caterpillar. And so, you know, we've, we work with those requirements and the design team, you know, with, with the, the brief that they get, that gave us, you know, they want something small, something that can hover above land, something that also can fly in space, you know, so you can just boot it out of the back of your freelancer. Um, and so this was a lot of times purely because uh, there's so many uh, kind of exposed components to, uh, to it. That basically means that the, um, it becomes a lot more kind of expensive as an asset. Uh, with a lot of the bigger ships, you can hide you know, components away. Whereas with the Dragonfly, everything's exposed. So you have to model everything. There's no smoke and mirrors here. Um, my job is essentially to start breaking that down into the separate items such as thrusters and all the general parts of the ship itself, such as the nose, the body, 
and beginning to break them to make them detachable and add damage effects and things like that. Um, overall, uh, we're beginning just by doing like a real rough white box flyable state on it. So we'll just get the model flying before we start breaking it all up. In the, in the Gamescom demo, we essentially showed off the kind of basic setup of the ground mode and also the space flight mode, um, where we were essentially showing it going off in space, landing inside the freelancer, going planet side, going out again, and being usable in its ground mode. Um, we have a lot more to add to that. So um, we're doing further work on the ground mode flight system, just really tweaking it, making sure that it feels spot on when you're riding along the planet. It enables you to store it um, in its smallest possible state on any of your cargo ships. I went with Harley Davis, um, and then it was a matter of finding out essentially what made motorbikes different from cars or spaceships or airplanes. It's the sort of connectedness with the environment, right? You're sort of racing along really near the floor. So the ground rush, particles, rocks, anything like that, that's going to hurt if you hit it hard enough. And the wind rush and stuff. I really wanted to get all of that stuff in there for the Dragonfly. So it was in stark contrast with all the other ships and vehicles we have in the game. The planet side stuff, um, the in-atmosphere flight, the sort of terrain traversal in wheeled vehicles and, and, and hover vehicles like the Dragonfly, um, I think provide a brilliant contrast between what we're used to, the sort of the space travel aspect, where you've got points of sound, very sharp, contrasty points of sound, very clean in the void. And then on planet side, we've got this um, much more grounded. Uh, when there's an explosion, it's going to echo around in canyons. You feel closer to the ground. You feel um, much like footsteps, different surfaces, surface types and stuff. You're going to have to feel that through the vehicle, you know? And it, it just gives a, a, I think it's a case of the, you know, the, the, the total is greater than the sum of the parts, really, because the space travel and the, the planet side stuff. And the, those two things contrasting with each other, I think, just sort of reinforce each other. Um, so it's kind of picking, picking what we can emphasize, like the ground effect stuff, um, like echoey stuff off canyons and mountains and things like that to give you a sense of where you are. Completely dedicated to ship salvage. So with the derelict ships, as always, as explained, we want to take the stuff that already exists in the game, which are broken up parts of the ships, that once the ship suffers catastrophic damage, it breaks apart. Um, how can we reuse these assets and, and kind of be very creative with them? The stuff that you saw in Gamescom was very much the first step of that. Um, we are already progressing further with it. So the work uh, that we're doing, as we've always explained, has always got a, lot, a longer path. Obviously, we've got kind of 3.0 coming due at the end of the year. The, the about kind of creating these, these, these options for design to have. So. Uh, if you come across uh, a derelict ship in, in space, don't be shocked, it's not a bug, it was always supposed to be there. Uh, it, it's something that, that this, you know, we, we want to push of, of all that is you don't have to worry about like impact points and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's there. If you think about the opening to episode 7, where you see a lot of kind of derelict um, Star Destroyers and whatnot in a desert, we can totally kind of focus on, on doing that and the, the asset hit and essentially man hours work that go into that are fundamentally less now. So we've got kind of challenges how we are going to blend them with the terrain. Uh, the terrain is very much kind of early days, um, but I'm, I'm very excited to kind of experiment with, with, you know, what would happen if we took a starfarer and buried it in the desert. How, how something erodes and decays in a desert is very different to how something would erode and decay in a swamp. So you've got those challenges to think about as well. But um, but the high level goal is for sure to have these in space.